it's Kristen here at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Today is Breast Construction or Breast Cancer Reconstruction Awareness Day or Bra Day as it's called colloquially. And so we are coming to you from Clements University Hospital. Today we're sitting down with plastic surgeons Nicholas Haddock and Samit Tosha to talk about breast reconstruction options. So, you know, as normal, you know, be sure that you like and share the conversation with your friends and your colleagues and ask questions. You can do so by asking them in the comments field. We'll be here for about 30 minutes. We're gonna take as many as we can. So please get those questions coming. In the meantime, if you have audio issues at any time during the chat, just refresh your browser. You know, sometimes that happens during these. So we're gonna get started. Dr. Haddock, Dr. Tiosha, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Uh, you guys are very busy this morning. You've got a, a couple surgeries to go on the breast reconstruction front though. I mean, why should people how, how many people undergo breast reconstruction? Well, I think the numbers in the country are somewhere around 90,000 or so mm -hmm. per year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what at least our society says, and it's that's a rough number, but it's somewhere around there. And, okay. So, yeah. And it's slowly increasing as mm -hmm. awareness is going. So I think that if you look at a statistics from even 10 years ago, so the growth rate is uh, more awareness and the population mm -hmm. and cancer being diagnosed Perhaps a lot earlier, so mm -hmm. I think we're looking at the numbers in the 100 to 110,000 a year mm -hmm. at this point. So that's the total amount of women per year in the United States. Wow. So I know that obviously it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. That's part of the reason we're doing this. What are some situations where breast reconstruction would be appropriate? Uh, I mean, the most common patient is a cancer patient, of course. Mm -hmm. So, you know, someone's diagnosed with cancer um, and then they either require or choose to undergo a mastectomy. And then we see them and discuss, you know, the various options of breast reconstruction. There's there's a whole other slam of patients that may undergo what would term breast conservation therapy, so a lumpectomy with radiation, and sometimes we get involved in in those type of surgeries as well. So it's okay. it's a pretty broad category actually. Okay, so you know, what are the pros? What are the pros and cons of doing breast reconstruction surgery? And after that, I want to talk a little bit about the different types that are mm -hmm. available. Uh, you know, the first, uh, the obvious question, the pros is uh, having to, you know, not only deal with breast cancer, but there's also changes in shape that can come with uh, treatment, whether it's chemotherapy or radiation therapy particularly. And right. so, and if there's mastectomy, there's absence of breast or tissue. So the pros are trying to build a breast, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's from an implant or own tissue and getting that sense of symmetry and maybe some related to function, because if you don't have a breast, there could be issues with shoulder and uh, you know clavicle and arm you know uh, function issues. So right. that is one of the motivations. The other is the aesthetic motivation, and I always say that it's a paradigm. As as humans, we want to we wake up looking, wanting to look better, and mm -hmm. getting by our day. And so that's sort of part of who we are. Mm -hmm. And that's a very big pro. The cons is having surgery, right? Uh, and you know that is no way to avoid it at this point. Right. Yeah, I would, I would just add one, one more thing. So in the sense of the pros, uh, currently in plastic surgery literature, is, it's in vogue to look at satisfaction and mm -hmm. right. patient happiness, and certainly there's a huge benefit to that. And there's pretty significant data that'll show that patients are happier they go through breast reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So in the sense of you know long-term satisfaction, I think we've, we've shown that. So there's a significant emotional component yeah. to it, yeah. And that's been shown by many studies yeah. to benefit the patient. So I've heard, so we're, we, gentlemen, we're starting to get some questions in. So our first question, and this is what we talked about beforehand, but you know, how long is the typical recovery time after reconstruction? Are we talking days, weeks, months? Yeah, I think it depends. Um, one thing that patients have to understand is that breast reconstruction is a process. Mm -hmm. So very rarely do you come in and it's a single surgery. So when we answer that question, it depends what step in the process, um, mm -hmm. but the whole process can be you know, a year, Two years it just kind of depends on what the patient requires now that mm -hmm. doesn't mean short-term recovery from surgery most of the recoveries for surgeries are maybe three weeks six weeks in the sense of you know restrictions from lifting and, and they're kind of out of work and things like that there's okay. no strict timeline yeah. uh, and it could be fairly short depending on their cancer treatment or mm -hmm. it could be longer depending again the type of cancer they have okay and I always mm -hmm. mention you know you don't have to stop your life or reconstruction, you can intermittently go about your day, have vacations, be with families, take time off, and then come back and sort of, you know, regroup. So mm -hmm. the timeline is a very patient-driven timeline. Okay, yeah. so really good question, Sierra. Thanks for putting that in. All right, one of the topics that came up was this idea of immediate implant reconstruction. 
does that take place right after a cancer surgery or is that again kind of dependent on the patient? Yeah, I think it depends on the patient. Um, the idea of, of truly immediate implant reconstruction means mastectomy happens and implant goes in at that exact same time. And, and certainly we can offer that to a, a number of patients, but you have to be the very correct patient for that. So generally that's gonna be a younger patient, non-totic, meaning non-hanging breast that can accommodate you know, a direct to implant. Okay. Um, more commonly, it's a staged approach to breast okay. reconstruction. That goes back to what we were kind of just talking about. It's a process that we go through. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've got a, um, a question from Crystal, and she says, is there a difference between breast implants and breast reconstruction? It sounds like yes. Yes. Uh, so obviously, the most common plastic breast surgery in the country is breast augmentation, and that's a cosmetic procedure that women do for either asymmetry or slightly smaller breasts. And so that is a breast implant surgery. And what we do is mainly after cancer or if they have predilection to yeah, cancer, genetic. a genetic predisposition to cancer like a BRCA gene. So okay. those patients have a mastectomy and then we can do an implant or own tissue. So okay. it's a totally separate group of patients than the cosmetic surgery patients uh, okay. for breast. Okay. So we got a question in from Maria, and Maria, this is a good one, and this is something we talked about a little bit earlier. She says, what are the pros and cons of implant reconstruction? It sounds like cons are that you have surgery. Are there other pros you wanna address? Yeah, I, I think that one of the cons you said is you have to have surgery, but I think that goes with kind of anything, right? So this yeah. entire process, um, so once you make the decision to go through breast reconstruction, we're, we're kind of moving past that. In the sense of implants alone, um, you know, pros and cons, it's, it, when we, when we talk about implants, we often compare it to our other option, which is a flap surgery. So, right. um, so that's kind of the pro-con comparison. And for the pros, implants is, a, is a generally a simple operation for the patient. It's less downtime, uh, so less pain. Okay. Surgery is generally confined to the breast, where we talk about the other option, flaps, where we talk about operating in different parts of the body and incisions in other places. Um, you know, people can get great results with implants, so they can be very happy in the sense of the aesthetic and mm -hmm. full breast. Uh, probably the biggest con is it's a foreign object. A lot of people don't like the idea of now I'm living with something inside of me forever. Right. Um, and right. you know, unfortunately, they don't last forever. Right. So there is there is some maintenance that generally people have to have in the future with implants. Okay, good to know. Good question, Maria. So another question we talked about this this idea of flap, and I know we do a number of flap procedures here. What is what does that mean? So flap is uh, it's a plastic surgery word, essentially meaning tissue from your own body that mm -hmm. is uh, connected or comes with a blood vessel. Okay. So and the blood vessel is usually artery and vein. The blood goes in and the blood goes out. Yep. And so lots of tissues can be connected to it. Uh, in our area, it's skin and also fat and soft tissue. Okay. Uh, and uh, rarely any muscle. Uh, so it's mainly sort of a fat and skin with blood vessel, and that's a flap. Wow. And that can come from, from our work, it can come from the back, it can come from the thighs, very commonly from the abdomen, mm -hmm. uh, it can come from the buttocks. So there's several mm -hmm. zones in the body that we can focus and take that tissue and transplant it. So essentially okay. a flap is generally a tissue that's transplanted, but it can also be twisted and turned as well. Okay, that, that sounds fascinating. Yeah. So what about this question? And I believe that, this is something we've, we've talked about a little bit. Can you get breast reconstruction 10 years after having a breast mastectomy? Sure. So generally there's no expiration to the option of breast reconstruction. So we see a lot of patients that maybe they had nothing done and they're completely flat, or maybe they had an implant placed and they're having problems with implants and whatnot. Okay. It's, it's 10 years later, maybe it's time that the implant failed. Well, mm -hmm. we, we'll do that operation. So we go back and, okay. and if they want another implant, we can do that or we can convert them to their own tissue and in the sense of a flap as we just talked about. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, I, we've certainly operated on people 10 years or even yeah. later from this doctor. Even 20 wow. years. Yeah. Or, or, really? if, uh, or if somebody's had reconstruction 10, 20 years ago mm -hmm. and their breasts have changed, changed. Yeah. and they have an implant that has a problem, uh, or they've had a breast cancer on the other side that didn't change. Okay. And so now they go through an entire new process, decades later perhaps, and we right. have several patients. Uh, and then now we get to finish them in the sense. Right. Uh, so those are the decade-old patients, and even longer. Good to know. 
Well, we've got a couple more questions in, but beforehand, I want to take a second and thank Moncrief Cancer Institute. They were really instrumental in helping us promote all these Breast Cancer Awareness Month chats. So thank you to them. You know, we're, what you were talking about, Dr. Teosha, a second ago was, you know, aging. You know, as you, how does aging impact these reconstructed breasts? Does it impact the same way that maybe one your natural breasts would be? So, That's kind of an uh, awkward question. No, no, it's, it's a great question because uh, it, it relates to the point what type of reconstruction that you can pick. So if a patient in their 30s, and patients do have cancer in their 30s, they, uh, and most of them are very curable and will live a normal long life, right. and so we talked to them about designing an operation that may last 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt that your own body tissue certainly lasts and ages appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, it is subject to body changes, just like anything our body would go through. Mm -hmm. But it would suit and correlate to it. Okay. And I would think that there's less operations that may be needed maintenance-wise. Okay. But if you take an implant, uh, which are absolutely, you know, which is about two thirds of the operations in the country are done by implants, out of okay. 100,000. Uh, they don't, in, implants don't age in a sense of what we think, tissues around it ages. Right. Uh, and it's not necessarily the fault of the implant, it's mm -hmm. just you may need to modify things about the body. Makes sense. So along the same lines, modifying, you know, you look at athletes and they're generally, they have lots of muscle, they're very toned. You know, if you were athletic, would for your or for your more athletic patients, does that often affect their choice of reconstruction procedures? Yeah, it certainly can. Um, so, athletic patients can certainly go with an implant, mm -hmm. um, and that's and that is what a lot of people will choose. But if a patient is looking for a non-implant based reconstruction and they're athletic, then often they don't have tissue on their tummy, and that's the, the deep flap is usually our go-to. That's what we right. do most commonly. Yeah. You know, when we're talking about flap reconstruction and uh, for the thinner patients, active patients, you know, runners, yoga, yoga enthusiasts that just don't have enough tissue there. And so what we do for those patients is called the PAP flap, and it's it's an acronym for the blood supply. It's front artery perforated flap. Okay. Um, and basically that comes from the back of the thigh. So, okay. so we offer that. It's something that we do that a lot of centers don't do and, and okay. makes us a little bit unique in that regard. Um, but it is an option for those patients so that okay. they can have natural reconstruction, you know, even though they're really thin. I want to emphasize that point because I know Dr. Haddock's very humble about it, but he, you know, he brought an idea of taking um, the tissue from the back of the thigh, not, mm -hmm. the, you know, not the front of the thigh, with a very well-known pioneer surgeon in New York, and so Dr. Haddock worked with him, and so when he came to Dallas, we were able to offer this tissue because even the most athletic person mm -hmm. uh, tends to have just a little bit of tissue at the back of the thigh. It's just yeah. how you know, uh, we're built. And, so for a person who is athletic, I generally they're smaller breasted, and mm -hmm. so, so you don't really need a lot of volume. Right. And so uh, if they want a permanent result, then I think that's an excellent option. And we are fortunate to have this work in a team approach. Of, we've done over 200 of those operations in, in, our, wow. in our group, uh, and probably one of the largest in the world, uh, along with another group. So. Uh, we've been lucky to have this specific type of surgery uh, to address. Right. We've operated on marathon runners, yeah. uh, ballerinas, uh, right. golfers. Right. So I, I think that's a, it's a small niche, but I think it's a, it's a very big niche for us. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear about, you know, and I definitely wanted to address that team approach, that that's something that we offer that's different here. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I joined faculty what, uh, six years ago, and and we kind of found that we were working, doing the same things in the rooms next to each other. Mm -hmm. And we decided to start working and collaborating together. And what that's done is it's really revolutionized, at least the care for these patients um, faster than operating mm -hmm. when we work together. So what, what could be a you know, 10 hour operation, now yeah. sometimes it's four to six, maybe wow. four hours. That's so a big difference. A significant yeah. change. And you know, if you change that from the beginning, then what happens is the patients do better postoperatively. They're out of bed quicker. They get home quicker, and they get back to the life quicker. So, and that's also one of the goal, right? Limit the morbidity to our patients, and and so that's a big part of what we do. And then just the collaboration between the two of us, we come up with a little more creative approach to things. We mm -hmm. start innovating, and that's kind of where we are now, at least. That's fascinating. Yeah, and I think the collaboration is vital because you know if an operation that lasts eight to ten hours, and I think as surgeons we pride ourselves being very intense and we are very focused, but 
there's a lot of moving parts in breast reconstruction from this mm -hmm. microsurgery flap to uh, opening the incision, cutting the incision, and then obviously what the patient ultimately wants and desires is to look good and appropriate, and right. that's the last thing that we yeah. do. And so you, you can't forget just to make it appropriate, but as best as they can do. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the most tired you are at the end of the operation. Right. Uh, it's just not closing for plastic surgeons. That's kind of what everybody sees. Right. So you know, in these complex surgeries, there's a constant dialogue Dr. Haddock and I are having with our team. Uh, what's the appropriate nature of how to make it as best you can at that point, considering there may be other surgeries. Uh, and there's no doubt that collaboration helps. Mm -hmm. Troubleshooting, because we are enjoy we fortunately enjoy a very high success rate of these operations, mm -hmm. but you know, these are blood vessels that are one or two millimeters, and they, you know, they can be moody, and, but we have a 99, 98% success in these operations. Wow. Uh, so I, I think the team approach is, is key. Wow. That's good. It's good to hear. So we've got we've got some more questions coming in from the audience. I want to make sure we get to these during our time. There was one that says, you know, going back to the implants, what is the difference between saline and silicone implants, and what are their individual advantages and disadvantages? Yeah, I, in breast reconstruction, I tend not to use that many saline implants. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say I haven't done it, but um, the truth is, it's very different in cosmetic surgery. In cosmetic surgery, there's a breast tissue over an implant, so you have coverage mm -hmm. over the implant. In breast reconstruction, there's not much coverage over this implant. So you really want the most natural appearing, most natural feeling implant available, and generally that comes in the form of silicone. Okay. Um, if a patient absolutely wants saline, then certainly we can put it in, but they have to understand that it's it's not gonna look the same. The silicone are just a better implant with, okay. with thin coverage over them. And the implants have really gotten better yeah. ever since 19, you know, 60s yeah. when they were first came in. Uh, and so every generation of implants tries to improve the last one. And mm -hmm. I think we're pretty good for a foreign body that is, you know, uh, that can change. But I, I think the implants are, are pretty darn good for mm -hmm. breast reconstruction patients now. So I have a question specifically for you, Dr. Tiosha, that came in ahead of time from a friend when she found out I was interviewing you. And she said, it looks like he's an artist and an illustrator. And she wanted to know how that helps you in your in your work as a breast reconstruction plastic surgeon. Well, specific, I mean, I can't, uh, you know, I can't uh, do a six month operation on a patient and it, what I do in art is, so it is different in a sense. And Dr. Haddock actually also had his training mm -hmm. in art in his undergraduate year. So uh, th there's no doubt all plastic surgeons have the predisposition towards art and some take it to another level and I've taken it to a different level in my mm -hmm. personal venues but the artistic component is the key process in, in what we do uh, and that goes from defining shadows, lines, uh, mm -hmm. shapes, uh, volume and adding biology and change to it and cancer to it and, and trying to do it. Uh, yeah, and it's not going to be perfect, but we're we're gonna we do our best. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I would say that vast majority of patients are very pleased by what they have and what they've gone through, uh, mm -hmm. given the fact that they have cancer. Uh, we we really enjoy the artistic process. That's so fabulous. Did you know that you were an artist as well? So we've got a new a new question in from Judy. So Judy says, "I had breast cancer 11 years ago and need a redo." She says, "I have implants." Could I do a procedure using my stomach fat instead of replacing the implants? She also asked about Medicare. I'm not sure if you're able to comment on Medicare. Yeah, um, we're pretty broad in the sense of what insurances we take, but um, you know, so we can address that as needed. But um, you know, in the sense of uh, implants exchange to to your own tissue, no question, we do it all the time. Um, so we see a lot of patients that either have uh, the term capsular contracture, which is uh, the scar around implant can become firm, hard, and in the worst case scenario, painful, and, and they don't want an implant anymore. And that's an unfortunate, we didn't say that as one of the cons of implants, but that is one of the potentially cons of implants. Um, so we do that, and then mm -hmm. people have had them in for a long time, and they may be ruptured and things like mm -hmm. that. We can take them out and then exchange to, to natural tissue, and it's a, that's a pretty common operation where we come back and do it as a secondary surgery. Okay. Well, good, a good answer. Good question. And I'm assuming Medicare, you know, generally patients are above 65 years old. And yeah. some of our older patients are 80. And, you know, I think it, age wow. is not the cutoff. Yeah. If, if, uh, if you're healthy and yeah. spunky and have very 
you know, good life spirit. And I've right. seen some 80 year old patients. I have done breast reconstruction on them. Yeah. Wow, that's uh, great. I like spunky. Yeah. <laughs> so Judy says, thank you, by the way. So we got another question here. What are the latest advances in plastic and reconstructive surgery that patients can look forward to? What's coming down the line? Anything new? Um, well, we just came out with a whole new generation of implants, so okay. I don't know that that is going to be a next step. We have the, the gummy bear implants that people will term, and, and that's kind of the latest generation. And basically what that means is it's a highly cohesive silicone, which means it sticks together more. So in okay. contrast to the older implants that would rupture and could leak and spread a little bit, these are almost more of a solid. So if you, if you look at them, you can actually take a knife and cut them in half, and they will remain two pieces. Wow. Um, so that's probably one of the most recent advances that, that and gummy bear is kind of a buzzword that people talk about. Mm -hmm. um, from our practice, you know, as, as we talked about, we're innovating in the sense of the flap options and we're mm -hmm. doing some combination flaps and things like that. So we might take tissue from both sides of the tummy for one breast or even from in unique patients we'll do from the thighs and the tummy for, for okay. the breast if someone you know, okay. uh, requires more volume. Um, that's something that we've been doing a lot. Yeah, and years. I think it's you have to, uh, and we're starting to recognize uh, as the more we do is that it's not also the breast, but it's yeah. where where the breast came from, mm -hmm. and how proportionally it looks like you know in a woman. So it has to go with their body habitus and what's appropriate. So if it means taking tissue from different parts and being very innovative about it and doing these multiple flaps that we do at one time. Uh, of course, the the technical aspects are extremely complex. Right. But we start to look at well, what about that scar from the thigh, or what about that scar from the abdomen, and perhaps it won't look good here, or the side of the thigh, or the back. So I think we're offering more options, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and having the fortunate uh, situation where we do nothing but breast reconstruction in our practice. I think we have a whole compendium of things we can offer, from simple things to extremely complex things. Yeah. So I would say the flexibility mm -hmm. is more as mm -hmm. as uh, patients have that availability among, mm -hmm. among expert teams. In that right. in that same light, um, you know, as physicians, our, our first thing is do no harm, right? So yeah. so in breast reconstruction, everyone focuses on the breast, mm -hmm. but when we start talking about some of these flaps, we really have to also talk about where we're getting the tissue from and do no right. harm to that area. So, you know, the flaps have gotten more advanced and more advanced and more advanced, and that means more technically challenging, mm -hmm. but, you know, centers of excellence and high volume, then they generally go very well, but it means less harm to the muscle, less harm to the native tissues of that mm -hmm. area and, mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. And that's, that's kind of where we keep pushing and pushing and pushing to where even the donor side, you know, looks better and is, is still very functional. Gotcha. So we've got about five minutes left, so now's the time to get those last minute questions in. So we've got to let Dr. Tiosha and Dr. Haddock go back to the ER, or the OR, excuse me, not the ER, not the ER. They've got to go back to the OR because they've got a busy day ahead. But one of the questions that did came through was somebody noticed that there was a release that went out recently about the pap 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 flap procedure. Mm -hmm. Is that one of those new things that you're discussing? Yeah, so and that's what we were talking about earlier, that the, the pap comes from the back of the thigh. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we had a patient that was nice enough to to do an interview and, and a press release and this was very kind in the sense of what she what she said. So so we always liked that. She was very happy. But um, but generally yes, that is that is tissue from back to thigh. That's what we're talking about for you know runners and, and mm -hmm. not even just runners and some of the young, our younger patients prefer that over the abdomen. Um, mm -hmm. But it's uh, it's we do a decent number of them, and that's one of the mm -hmm. things that's unique. It has become a ex our number two goal after yeah. the abdomen, uh, okay. and we see patients from all over the place uh, yeah. who've had uh, reconstruction before, and uh, for whatever unfortunate reason, their tissue from the abdomen didn't make it, mm -hmm. uh, and we go ahead and do other mm -hmm. microsurgery from the back of the thigh uh, in areas where it's extremely difficult to get that success. So. Mm -hmm. We've been lucky with that, and I think uh, you know we're certainly trying to get our work out there in terms of scientific publications, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. even balancing our busy practice. We're you know we're, we're traveling and presenting our work and, uh, all over the country. And okay. this, I mean, as you said, we have a number of patients that come in from even out of state, so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do that. And of course, Dallas is an easy place to travel to, so um, you know people will do other options and and have unfortunate failures, and of course that can't happen. Right. But um, with the pap flap, it is something that then we can still go back and offer natural reconstruction mm -hmm. for a patient, even in the setting of a failure. Gotcha. So earlier we spent some time talking about the, the team approach here that obviously you two are a team. 
who else is in that team? Do you work with you know the breast, the cancer surgeons as well as any other? Who else is in there? Yeah, it, we certainly collaborate with our cancer surgeons. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have a great team here, and you know they're they're kind of the the first person, and then they see the patients and send them to us, and then we're one big team initially. Once you get through the first cancer operation, then generally we kind of take over the surgical care after that, and, mm -hmm. and then as we talked about the process and stages. In, in the operating room at this hospital, uh, we have a fantastic team. So we've got you know our nurses, we have our scrub techs, and and because anesthesia, anesthesia mm -hmm. and because we do a pretty high volume of all of this, um, we have a, we have a pretty well oiled machine, so things go quick. They, mm -hmm. they just move the way they're supposed to, and of course that comes with experience and, and right. whatnot. So. And to add that, we because we're a teaching institution, we have you know training. We train a program mm -hmm. of residents. We have mm -hmm. uh, fellows who have finished their training and want focused expert uh, in microsurgery. So they're all scrubbed in. We are the ones who drive the ship and we always mm -hmm. tell the patients and mm -hmm. that, you know, the residents who are training, they're training under our wing and we teach them, but we combine and do operation. And I tell the patients, listen, I don't put every stitch in you. Right. Because if I did, it will take literally two days to finish. And, and I, that's not safe because there's so many moving parts. But right. uh, our resident team and medical student team, you know, they make it better. You know, they make it faster, they make it better, they take care of our patients at multiple levels or mm -hmm. all during the night. And I think because of that, our complications are low, our success is high, mm -hmm. and our education uh, is even more elevated because we live in a glass bubble. Everything we do is watched mm -hmm. at all levels. Right. So you can't get away with anything. Um, and I think it's a benefit that the teaching institution is a key factor on what we do. Yeah. Well, they ask questions, right? They so, ask questions, so anytime right? you're pushed with questions, it right. makes you think, and mm -hmm. then you innovate, and you and you keep doing more and more and more. Right. So that's you know. The they keep us process. young. Yeah. yeah. That's really important. So I think that is all the time we have today. We've got some great questions. I again want to thank the Moncrief Cancer Institute for helping us promote these chats, as well as for all the wonderful questions came in. Most importantly, to thank you, Dr. Haddock and Dr. Teosha, for spending time answering all these questions today. Really appreciate it.